And now we've seen this great theorem, Van Kampen's theorem, for computing fundamental groups, and we want to see the proof. So suppose we got this space X that we've decomposed as a union of two open sets, U and V, uh, where the overlap intersect V is uh, path connected. And let's pick a point, little x, in the intersection. Remember what we're trying to prove is that pi 1 of x base at little x is the amalgamated product of pi 1 of u with pi 1 of v amalgamated over the intersection. Now I want to rephrase that slightly. As follows. I want to say this group, the amalgamated product, by definition is a quotient of the free product pi 1 u star pi 1 v. In other words, where we don't introduce the amalgamated relations by a subgroup which is generated by the amalgamated relations. So if you remember the definition of the amalgamated product, we took all the generators and relations from pi 1 of u, all the generators and relations of pi 1 of v, and we added in some extra relations. So what that amounts to is just taking the free product of the two groups, pi 1 of u, pi 1 of v, with no extra relations, and then dividing out by a subgroup, which I'm going to call amal, which is a normal subgroup. It has to be normal if you want to divide by it. And this is the normal subgroup. Uh, generated by the amalgamated relations, in other words, by elements of the form I star C times J star C inverse, where here I is the inclusion map from the intersection to u and j is the inclusion map from the intersection into v. Notice that if I divide out by the subgroup that contains these guys, then I'm essentially saying i star c, j star c inverse equals the identity. So in that quotient, i star c will be equal to j star c. Right, now that I've exhibited the answer, as a quotient, it becomes clear how we should proceed. Namely, I need to write down a homomorphism from the free product pi 1 of u star pi 1 of v to pi 1 of x, whose kernel is the amalgamated relation or the amalgamated subgroup. So let's call that homomorphism phi. Let's write a sentence. We need to find a homomorphism phi from pi 1 of u star pi 1 of v to pi 1 of x, whose kernel equals the subgroup amal. Right, and then by the first isomorphism theorem, we're done. And it doesn't take too much imagination to figure out what this homomorphism should be. So we need a map from pi 1 u star pi 1 v to pi 1 x. Well, that means something that takes a word of loops in u and v and returns a loop in x. Well, loops in u are loops in x because u is a subset of x. Loops in v are loops in x because v is a subset of x. So, given a word, and 
let's say u1, v1, u2, v2, un, vn um, in this free product where the u's live in pi 1u and the v's live in pi 1v um, we get um, an element phi of u1, v1, etc. in pi 1 of x given by phi of u1, v1, etc. equals, now I'm going to need some notation, um, let's say a star u1, b star v1, a star u2, b star u, uh, v2, etc. Where a and b are the inclusion maps from u into x and, and b from v into x. Right, so all I'm saying is we've got a bunch of loops in U, a bunch of loops in V, we multiply them together and we think of them as loops in X. That gives us a map from the free product and by definition it's homomorphism because if I concatenate two words and then apply this map, all I'm doing is applying the map to each of the factors in each word and concatenating those together. So it clearly satisfies the homomorphism condition. Which means I need to do two things. I need to prove that its image is pi 1 of x, as in the whole of pi 1 of x. I need to show it's surjective. And we need to prove that the kernel is the amalgamated subgroup. first of these is uh, easier than the second, so let's uh, copy the image from the previous slide and embiggen it. Okay, so I want to prove that this map is, is surjective. That means given any loop based at x, let's do it in green, I want to write it as a concatenation of loops, some of which happen in U, some of which happen in V, rather than just one big loop that happens in U, U and V. So clearly what I want to do is pinch off subloops, like for example this, uh, maybe do it in orange, this guy. It's not a loop, but it almost comes back to x, so I want to somehow pinch it off and then come back and continue while I'm in v, and then come back to x, and then back here, continue in u, and back, and back again, and then in v. Okay, that's what I want to do. That's basically what the proof is going to be. So how do I say that rigorously? Well, here we go. Um, pick a loop. Let's call it gamma. In X, based at little x. Since the interval is compact, And 
since Gamma is a continuous map. I get an open cover of the interval by the pre-images of U and the pre-images of V. A map has a finite subcover, that's where the compactness comes in. Um, so the interval can be uh, subdivided into finitely many segments. say this is our interval there's a segment t0 equals 0 to t1 and then t2 to t minus 1 and then tn is the endpoint so these are the sub intervals into which we are subdividing such that gamma restricted to the sub interval between t i and tj, oh sorry, ti and ti plus 1. Uh, is contained, I mean this image is contained entirely inside u or entirely inside v. So, for example, in this picture I was drawing before, um, let's pick another color. Let's pick cyan, see if that's visible. Okay, so you might take this sub interval. It's the first one, right? That is a path contained entirely inside you. And then you might take this as the next one. A path contained entirely inside V, and then you might take this as the next one that's entirely inside U, and then finally this guy is entirely inside V. So you're subdividing into four intervals. Now that's not quite enough because we need to write the loop gamma as a concatenation of loops in U and in V, and currently we're just writing it as a concatenation of paths. So what we need to do is uh, let gamma i be the path gamma restricted to this subinterval between ti and ti plus 1 and then cap off gamma i so um, for each um, i pick a path in the intersection u intersect v um, from x to gamma at ti. Right, so for example, if this is, uh, so which is the first point? So we start off at x, we move around until we come to this point. So that's sort of gamma of t1. So we pick a path from x to t1. Well, we also pick a path from x to t2 and to t3. And we just concatenate. Um, I should give these guys names. Uh, let's call this beta i. So then, if I want to get a loop from x to itself, I need to go along beta i to this point uh, gamma of ti. Then I need to go along this subinterval from gamma of ti to gamma of ti plus 1, which I was calling gamma i. And then I need to go back to x, but now along the path bi plus, beta i plus 1 inverse. So this is a loop. Maybe 
should draw a picture of this. So we zoomed in version of the previous picture. So here is um, here is a segment of our path contained entirely inside U. So this is the path gamma i, going from gamma t i to gamma t i plus one. And here are our paths beta. I'm just picking some paths. Doesn't matter which they are. This is beta i. And this is beta i plus one. And you can see you get a loop by going along beta i first, then along gamma i, and then backwards along beta i plus one. And then the claim is if I multiply these guys together, what I get is homotopic to gamma. So let's say beta n inverse gamma n minus one beta n minus one concatenated with beta n minus 1 inverse gamma n minus 2 beta n minus 2 concatenated with all the way down to uh, beta 1 inverse gamma 0 beta 0 is well it's homotopic to the path beta n inverse gamma n minus 1 times gamma n minus 2 all the way down to gamma 0 just by uh, times beta 0 just by cancelling beta n i with beta n i inverse beta n minus 2 with beta n minus 2 inverse now beta 0 is a path from x to gamma of t0 but gamma of t0 is x so we might as well assume this to be the constant path and similarly for beta n so actually we can ignore these two n terms where they each taken to be constant so we just get the concatenation of the sub intervals gamma 0 up to gamma n minus 1 and that's homotopic to gamma and now we've done what we wanted because each of these factors is a loop entirely inside u or entirely inside v. So that proves this map phi is surjective. So now comes the, the tricky part. So I want to see that the kernel of this map phi is this amalgamated subgroup. Hmm. So what does it mean to be in the kernel of phi? So the kernel of phi comprises words u1, v1 to un, vn such that when I consider this as a product in pi1 of x which remember I was writing as a star u1, b star v1, etc. Where these a and b are the inclusions of u into x. Then this loop has to be homotopic to the identity, or to the constant loop. And, you know, I'm making a total hash of distinguishing between things that are loops and things that are homotopy classes of loops it doesn't really matter right so that that's what the kernel is it's the words where if you think of them as concatenating and giving a loop in pi 1x you get the constant loop that's homotopy so let's pick a homotopy from 
the concatenation. to the constant loop. Right, that's all I can do at this stage in the proof. That's all I know. That's all I'm guaranteed to have. Ah, such a homotopy. So such a homotopy is a map, remember, from the square. Into X. Where along the bottom edge everything gets sent to the point x along the top edge everything gets sent to the point x along this edge here the right hand edge again everything gets sent to the point x because this is supposed to be the constant loop and along this edge here i'm doing this concatenated path so let me divide this edge into sub intervals on this edge i'm doing the path u1. I'm going to suppress the a's and b's. Then I'm doing v1, u2, etc. all the way up to vn. Right, that's what my homotopy is. So what I would like to do now is to play a similar trick to the one we played in the previous part of the proof and subdivide the square into smaller squares such that each of those smaller squares is either a homotopy in U or a homotopy in V. So again I can do that because the square is compact. And H is continuous. So the pre-images of U and V give me an open cover of the square and I can take a finite subcover and then I can just subdivide the square so that each square lives inside that or one of the sets from that finite subcover. So let me say so we can subdivide. Into a finer grid. So that each subsquare is mapped by H to either U or to V. Moreover, I want this subdivision to be a refinement of the subdivision that I have already along the left-hand edge. In other words, if I just draw straight lines across like this and then make that into squares, I want my refinement, my very fine grid, to be a refinement of this one. And that's okay, I can always make things smaller. Now, for simplicity, I'm going to draw my grid uh, in a very non-refined way. So I'm just going to draw a 2 by 2 grid. This will just make our lives a little bit easier in following what's going on. So over here I have my path u1, v1, and I'm just going to have u and v again for simplicity. Over here I have the constant path x, the constant path x, the constant path x. And each of these squares is getting mapped to either u, which you remember was in red, or to v, which is in blue. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by looking at this path that goes up 
this side of the square and then across horizontally. What is this path? If I at least if I concatenate it with or compose it with the function h, the homotopy, then this green path is u v x x, which is homotopic to u v. And this is the guy I started with that lived in the kernel of phi. This path, which goes horizontally along and then vertically up, by contrast, is the constant path x, 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 x. And what I would like to do is to write down a sequence of paths in between which uh, I guess I'm going to call lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, lambda 4, and then have an extra superscript here that tells you whereabouts in the sequence it is. So this is the first path. That's, that's this one here. And then there's going to be a lambda 1. 2, lambda 2, 2, lambda 3, 2, lambda 4, 2, etc. A sequence of paths, all of length 4. And those paths are going to be obtained in the following way. You start with this green path, the next path, lambda 1, 2, lambda 2, 2, etc. That's going to be this guy. The one that goes up one, across one, up one, across one. And then you compose that with the function h. So this guy is lambda two, uh, 1, 2. This is lambda 2, 2, lambda 3, 2, lambda 4, 2. Right, so the lambdas are obtained by restricting the homotopy h to an arc in the square, just a small interval that's part of this square grid. Now here is the sort of dream proof, which is what you would like to say from this point onwards. You would like to say these lambdas are loops. Unfortunately they're not loops, but if they were, we could say that this first line goes to this second line by a homotopy that happens entirely inside V because the green path is homotopic to the grey path via a homotopy that happens entirely inside this square and then under the, the function h that maps entirely inside v. In other words, to go from lambda 1, 1, lambda 1, 2, lambda 1, 3, lambda 4, 1, 4 to lambda 2, 1, lambda 2, 2, lambda 2, 3, lambda 2, 4 we just need to use relations inside v. Subsequently, to go from this lambda 2 concatenation to the lambda 3 concatenation, which is going to be, what color should I do? Um, maybe I will do it in cyan. This is lambda 3. So in particular, this guy is lambda 3, 3, for example. So this cyan path is related to the grey path by a homotopy that happens entirely in this region, which is mapped into U. So you think the next homotopy, the next rewriting, only involves relations inside U. But wait! On the previous line, this lambda 2 this guy, uh, lambda 2, 3, here, is a path in V. And on the next line, it's replaced with something in, in, in U. And, you know, we're only supposed to use relations in U, but this guy is, is, is in V. So what's going on? So this is in V. So how can I say, 
I just go from this line to the next line using relations in U. It doesn't make sense. I have to first convert this to a word in U. I have to con convert lambda 2, 3 to a, a path in U. And I can do that because this line lives on a square that's mapped entirely to V and also on a square that's mapped entirely to U. So actually this path lambda 2, 3 maps into U intersect V. So I can consider it inside V or I can consider it inside U and it's the same path either way. So not only are we using relations in U to rewrite here, we're also using the amalgamated relations. Okay, and that's actually sufficient now. At every stage, we're either using a relation in U, a relation in V, or an amalgamated relation to first get ourselves to a point where we can use a relation in U or a relation in V. Unfortunately, this argument is not quite uh, meaningful because lambda ij, as I've said, is not really a loop. It's a path. And these relations we're talking about are relations in the fundamental group, which is, that is to say, relations on loops, not on paths. So to fix that, I need to modify my homotopy h. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to modify it near each node of this grid, each vertex of the grid. So that's sufficient, right? I want these arcs like this one here, this, this pink one here, to be um, mapped to loops under the function h. So it's sufficient that each of the vertices of the grid maps to the point x. If that's the case, then each of these lambdas will be a loop and you can run the argument I just gave. So let's see how we would modify this homotopy to make this vertex, say, in the very middle, go to the point x. So here's the same picture with all the extraneous information removed. I have my square that's been subdivided, my homotopy H and my point, which I'm going to call P, uh, which is a vertex of this grid subdivision. And I want a new homotopy, so a new map from the square that sends P to the base point instead of to whatever random, set, ra random point that it currently sends it to is h of p. So I'm going to pick a path delta from x to h of p and then I'm going to try and modify the, the homotopy just in a small disk around p. So I've got to do something First of all, to make a bit of room around P, right? So currently I only know what happens at P. It goes to H of P. I want to make a small disk around P where this homotopy is constant. So I'm going to pre-compose this homotopy with a quotient map that takes a disk of some radius epsilon. So D radius epsilon to that point P. So what is this map? Um, well, if S is the square, this is the quotient map from S to S over D. Uh, I claim if I quotient out a disk at the center of the square, what I get is again the square. So D is mapping to P under this quotient map. Okay, so that's the first thing I'm doing to modify my homotopy. Now I'm going to modify the homotopy on D itself. So uh, let's give this a name. The composition of this quotient map with H 
um, I'm going to call h prime and then I want to change h prime and replace it with some other homotopy so the new homotopy is going to be called h prime prime this goes from s to x and the key point is going to be that h prime prime of the center point p is going to be x right so um how am i going to define it well h prime prime restricted to s minus d in other words away from this disk it's going to agree with h prime restricted to s minus d right so i'm not changing anything outside this disk and on the disk i'm going to set h prime prime in polar coordinates on the disk uh, to be well it's going to be x at radius 0 right because we want our center point to map to x it's going to be hp at radius epsilon and in between it's going to be delta this path um, so I should probably say this is uh, R over epsilon All right so when R is epsilon this gives me delta of 1 that's H of P and when R equals 0 I get delta of 0 which is X the start point of the path okay so this is going to be my my new homotopy that i actually use in the proof and by construction this new homotopy sends each vertex of the square grid to the base point x which is great the only thing i have to be epsilon careful about is that each of the squares in the grid still maps to either u or to v and i can do that by a careful choice of this path delta so I need to just add that delta satisfies the following conditions. So either delta is contained entirely inside u, and that happens if p is completely surrounded by red squares, so squares that are sent entirely into u by the homotopy, or delta is contained entirely inside v if p is surrounded by blue squares, or if it's surrounded by a mixture like in this picture then d is sent to the intersection so i'm just going to write this i said what i really meant that the one of these three conditions holds depending on what the neighboring squares look like so that's the proof let's just recap what we did because it's kind of a long and slightly technical proof we wanted to show that the kernel of phi was the amalgamated subgroup so to do that we had to show that anything that was in the kernel of phi let me back up the uh, document anything that was in the kernel of phi um, can be rewritten using the amalgamated relations as just the identity that will show that the kernel is the amalgamated subgroup and to do that we picked a homotopy which we subsequently had to modify slightly to make the proof really work uh, from this concatenated loop u1 u2 etc u1 v1 u2 u v2 blah 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 to the constant loop we subdivided the square into lots of smaller squares so such that the homotopy restricted to each of those smaller squares mapped entirely into u or entirely into v then we said okay by this trick 
of taking a family of paths that goes around two edges of the square then up across up across and then up across across up etc we got a family of paths which we could think of as rewriting the original path using relations in v relations in u and the amalgamated relations and eventually starting with the thing we wanted the concatenation u1 v1 u2 v2 we end up with just the constant path now that's exactly what we wanted to do to show that the thing that started in the kernel of phi ends up being in the amalgamated subgroup the only problem was that the intermediate paths we were using were not loops they were just paths and to fix that we changed the homotopy by this trick in the very final slide so that's a I don't know it's a complicated proof I would say but now you should feel a sense of relief and a sense of power because now that you've seen the proof you can really feel justified in using the theorem and now you can use the theorem to compute any fundamental group you like